Yeah, but that, I, that idea of their doing a, of having a, um, a conference is a good idea. You, you're actually thinking in, in July, right? In July, yeah. Great. Maybe Absolutely. you can come to us. Oh, by all means, I'd love to. It's in Washington. Yeah, that would be. Michael uh, Chugigan. That would be really relevant. Good evening. Good evening and welcome very much to Conversations, where we're pleased to welcome to the program Dr. Bertrand Chattel. And uh, this is the second time that Dr. Chattel has been a, mem uh, 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 a guest of Conversations. And I am truly in, uh, pleased to be able to invite him uh, to uh, and welcome him to Conversations and to Manhattan Neighborhood Network for the second time. I wonder, I wonder, Dr. Shah, we, we, we want to talk about a subject which both you and I and a growing number of people would, would agree is perhaps the leading problem confronting mankind but seems not to be in the normal discourse addressed by nearly enough uh, policy decision makers, much less even intellectuals and so forth. That being the whole question of the relationship between technology and labor in the overall operation of the economy. We want to talk about that subject. But I wonder if first, before we do, if maybe you could share with myself and with the cable television audience your own background, please. I know you yeah. have a, a, a doctorate degree in, in, yeah. in economics. You've been at the UN. But could you talk about your, your background? You were born in France and so yeah. forth, and sort of, in a sense, establish for the audience yeah. your, your background? Well, I have um, started in um, electrical engineering, and I have a degree in, uh, in the University of Paris, mm -hmm. and also uh, um, in economics. Mm -hmm. uh, Institut d'études politiques in uh, Paris. Ah, that's a doctorate degree there. Doctorate degree, yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. And uh, I worked uh, in uh, in a factory mm -hmm. for uh, as manager of a factory. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, I was in the European Space Agency in uh, the Hague in the uh, Netherlands. Yes. As an engineer, an engineer for. Uh, uh, technical uh, um, studies of his uh, center, mm -hmm. and uh, afterwards I went uh, in the United Nations in the Office for Science and Technology of the uh, Economic and Social uh, Department. Mm -hmm. And you were, if I may, I, I know perhaps you don't want to, but I would, uh, in a certain sense, underscore the fact that you were head of a very important agency. I think it's called the Office of Scientific Advising to the United Nations, and you were the head yeah. of that office. That was a very responsible job in this age of uh, scientific and, uh, and rapid technological development. But as yeah. was your position the yeah. head of that office? Yeah, uh, uh -huh. sci science application section yes. of the Office for Science and Technology uh -huh. in the Economic and Social Affairs uh -huh. of the United Nations in New York. Yeah, and good. the objective was to uh, promote uh, science and technology applications in the developing countries to foster their uh, development. Yeah, very good. And you were able to bring to that your own economics background and yeah. understanding of economics, yeah. so the continuing understanding science, of the importance uh, yeah. of the of the of between the two. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. Also fought with the Free French Forces in the Second <laughs> War, right? Yeah. And that sort of thing. And you're obviously French. You were approximately how long with the United Nations? Then I was uh, eleven years. Eleven in the years. UN. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And before I was in the European uh, Space Agency in, in The Hague for the preparation of the first uh, European Space Laboratory. I see. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, those are indeed. And now you are. Um, and I am a consultant mm -hmm. uh, to various uh, companies and uh, the UN occasionally. Yes, I see. And you're also involved with a conference that we are going to want to talk some detail yeah, yeah, I'm about, but I'm wondering if maybe then, with that introduction and so forth, if we could address this issue, uh, I don't know what we call it, we were talking just before we came on crop yeah. camera, but in general, it is the problem of the very, very rapid technological and economic yeah. potentiality of our developing world economy, various national economies, but that we have structural problems yeah. uh, that uh, are not adequately addressed in terms of the uh, distribution of income and there, we're not nearly performing in anything like the stage that we might be able to. And things are, are we, have, we have a problem in that employment field or in that general yeah. fact that there has been technological displacement of mm -hmm. workers within the economic process. And unfortunately, from certain perspectives, that looks like it will continue into the future if, yeah. if it's a future where we don't have some answers to it. But I wonder if you could address yeah. that broad general problem. So, 
I, I am a, a member of a club of Rome. Yes. And the club of Rome is a think tank which has already addressed the problems of growth, the limits to growth, yes, a, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we are addressing the problem of unemployment and mm -hmm. underconsumption as a main uh, uh, problem which uh, humankind is uh, facing at the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will have a meeting in, in July in Washington, D.C., with the World Future Society, where we will discuss, with uh, some participation of the World Bank, the problem of uh, unemployment in, in the 21st century. How, what will be unemployment in the 21st century? Because at the moment, you have in the United States 7% of the active population. In Europe, it's about uh, 10, 12%. In France, 12 percent. The number of uh, unemployed in Europe is 20 million persons. Mm -hmm. In China, it is considered that uh, in the year 2000, the estimate is that there will be 200 million Chinese unemployed. Staggering. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in developing countries, the, it's not 10 percent, it is sometimes 40 percent or 60 percent of a population which is un unemployed, which means that the, the majority of the population in the developing countries is unemployed. Yeah, that's so, amazing. So it's yeah. amazing. And yeah. if you total it for the world, you, you will see that uh, on, uh, let us say, four and a half billion persons on the planet, there is half of them is unemployed. Well, we have about 5.7 billion total now. 5.7. So you take the, active, the yeah. economic aid. So uh, you the take active. the active population, yeah. potential active population in this planet, let's say uh, 3, 4 billion. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you, uh, it's considered that half of them are unemployed. So this is a population of about one and a half to two billion persons. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> I've seen I've, I've seen figures, and it's been it, it begins to get around now. Stanley Aronowitz and others uh, figures where it's uh, 800 to 800 million worldwide unemployed. But if yeah. one also begins to bring in the distinction of of what they call unemployed and underemployed, yeah, I'm then the, the numbers get yeah. up to where it becomes staggering. Yeah, and uh, it's it's also a problem if I may interject here, just on top of this problem, that is, if they're underemployed, they are also, as you say, unable to have the income in order to yeah. consume what yeah. the economy is able to produce. Yeah. And so the economy will not perform well. Mm -hmm. The United States economy has performed very badly over these last decade. Yeah. I mean, 2% growth rate or something? Well, you, you have in the United States, you have a, an active population of uh, 80, 80 million. If you take 7%, it's about uh, six, six million uh, unemployed. Mm -hmm. Six million unemployed. And uh, they receive uh, an allowance for unemployment, which is, uh, you, you know better the price than I do, yeah. maybe $400 I guess, something uh, like per month. Mm -hmm. And uh, if they were employed, uh, this person would get perhaps $1,500. Mm -hmm. So there is a gap of $1,000 in the consumption, That's right. which is not consumed. And then the marketeers, which are trying to sell their product, instead of selling $1,500 product every month, they sell only $400. Yeah, that's right. Multiplied by 6 million unemployed, and you get a huge sale, which is missing. And another thing on top of that is, and we talk, it's generally coming now under the term of the United States, and I guess it's happening in other places, is the, is the fact that the technology and the productive capability of the technological systems is creating the ability to produce more and more yes. goods and services, yes. and yet in the, in the operation of our economy, what it results is for, the pe for so many of the people is they are fired from their job yeah. or downsized yeah. because the technology is able to do what it required many more people to do mm. in the past. Yeah. And this is the problem that seems not to be adequately addressed. I believe, and it's yeah. one that you are particularly this concerned with. This is a problem. With. Yeah, you the technological displacement yeah. of labor in the productive process. Yeah. For instance, when I came to the United States for the first time, I was in, the, in a mission of a Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. 
because France was in a very bad shape. It mm -hmm. was in 1948, mm -hmm. and we were trying to discover why the American uh, economy was so productive. And the problem was productivity, how to increase productivity. Mm -hmm. Productivity, it was to um, replace human labor by automated machines. Mm -hmm. And this was the first objective of, of, of industry, mm -hmm. to eliminate labor wherever they could, so that automatic robots and, uh, uh, could, uh, could do their work. So it has created a huge unemployment, mm -hmm. and we are suffering uh, from this now. And when the women entered in, I have nothing against the women, oh, but when they entered the labor force, it doubled the demand for work, yes. for a, work, a volume of work which was already shrinking. Yes. So uh, unemployment, uh, again, for uh, two labor force, men and women. And th this is why we are in this situation. And uh, in the developing countries, there is very little uh, entrepreneurship, uh, very small consumption, and therefore uh, endemic, uh, uh, as we said, uh, unemployment. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is uh, the pre present situation. So the, the idea is to try to recover this underconsumption of the unemployed. How can we um, provide some purchasing power to the unemployed? Good. Now, this is a problem for this me. Is the, this is the problem so that the economy can function. Yeah. And you, you would like to see a free market or a market economy function to be healthy and well and help yeah. meet the needs of uh, people. Right. I understand mm. and so forth. But if you have, and you said, since the Industrial Revolution, I, I just did a program a while back about the in implications of the steam engine and the Industrial Revolution itself. The whole purpose, in a certain sense, of the Industrial Revolution was to displace labor from perhaps some of the onerous tasks of creating um, goods and services and so forth. Some people see it that way, that labor, it is a labor-saving devices that we have. We don't have to have labor uh, in order to produce. And now, but, and, and it was, and at following the Second War here in the United States, our economy was booming productivity rose very smartly, yeah. and wages tracked productivity very well oh. in the United States, now I tell you, yeah. until about 1973. Yeah. After 1973, for some reason, that is, uh, after 1973, wages began to stagnate, and they are even now coming down, even in the United States, um, even though the productivity capability, the overall ability of the economy, to produce goods and services is rising with the advancement of technology, but the labor is, is not tracking it. And more and more people which had seen an upward increase in their living standard mm -hmm. are seeing a stagnating or even a decreasing standard, even in this, the richest economy yeah. in the world. And many people say it's the, the source of a free-floating sense of angst or political disquietude among the American people sure. within their own economy. Everywhere in the world. But around the world. Around the world. Uh-huh, okay. So this is a, so. Why, why, why is it, in your estimation, or could, as an economist, that that tracked well the, mm. the distribution via wages or employment of the product, overall production of the economy through productivity analysis worked until 1973, and then it, it began not to work even in the United States after 1973, and the trends are bad now, and it seems not to be working well now the distribution of income by because labor. You had, at that moment, very little production in the developing countries. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, now uh, the market, the main market in the United States is uh, oriented towards the uh, Pacific region. Mm -hmm. the, all the uh, countries which are around the Pacific. In 1970, as you say, there were a very, a very small uh, production there. But in the meantime, since uh, 20 years, all these countries, would it be uh, developing countries or African or even uh, uh, Asiatic uh, countries, they have uh, started developing uh, their economy and their production. Why? Because their labor was about half or sometimes one-tenth of the labor cost in the United States or in Europe. So uh, uh, the industrialists began to to transfer 
we are uh, production units to uh, Taiwan, to Korea, to, uh, to um, uh, developing countries, and we are starting uh, producing a, a lot of products. And uh, let us say Japan also, for instance, uh, has uh, exactly uh, also. And Europe began to recover too. And Europe yeah, after <laughs> recovered the Marshall too, War. thanks to the Marshall Plan. Yeah. So, so yeah, right. there is not only uh, there is not now a single uh, production uh, pole, but there is a multi-pole uh, production in the world, mm -hmm. and therefore all these countries are competing to produce, and it is a completely different situation than the one in uh, the period you you spoke about. Uh -huh, and that yeah. and that's one of the and in a certain sense that is a good thing because yeah. employment is increasing in other parts of the world yeah. and there isn't a competitiveness to the global economy now that yeah. is beginning to develop and in a in a capitalist way of thinking or in a traditional free market way of yeah. thinking there ought to be not just a, a you know there are not be just one giant monopoly trust <laughs> or something or one country that rules the whole economy of the world the competition is good because then that can make for efficiencies yeah. Uh, does fact, that, is that to say then that at a certain sense on a, on a national, on a world scale, that uh, the workers that were being paid such high salaries in the United States immediately after the Second World War, say until, yeah. until this current phase, and that they were being paid artificially high wages in terms of the market? And is it now an adjustment of that and that they are going to have to uh, be satisfied with taking less and less income because they're now being brought into competition with labor that will work for much less mm. uh, in other parts of the world and that the income levels of people within the United States, let's say, yeah. are uh, working people, are going to uh, be coming down much less going up as they had in the past? Yeah, so for instance, look in New York City. You mm -hmm. had a lot of textile, uh, Sixth Avenue, Fashion Avenue, mm -hmm. textile manufacturers, working in apartments and all that. Now we have a common market with Mexico, for instance. Mm -hmm. It has not been long for the manufacturer in this area to move their production facility uh, to Mexico. And therefore, there is unemployment in New York City uh, because of this displacement of labor. And uh, therefore, uh, this, is, uh, this is a situation now which, which we are facing, and uh, traditionally, the governments have um, organized um, allowances for unemployment. Allowances, yeah. Uh, unemployment mm -hmm. allowance. For instance, I don't know how much it is, maybe $400 a month or something like this. Mm -hmm. for the, but what happens is that these governments are broke now. Mm -hmm. The U.S. government is in a complete deficit. It will be settled in seven years, but I'm not sure. In uh, all the European countries, it's the same. All the governments are deficit. And uh, therefore, uh, Latin America, deficit, mm -hmm. all these countries. So people are continuously asking to governments to uh, provide unemployment allowance. But these governments have no money. So as we say in France, it is, you cannot comb a devil which has no hair. No, they, they <laughs> so <do>. yes. <laughs> you cannot get money from uh, people or institutions who have no money. Yeah. So the government is gone yeah. because the money is elsewhere. I the see. money is not anymore in these governmental agencies uh -huh. which are broke. The money is gone in private sectors where is heaps of money well. which are untapped. And this is the international capital flows of exchange between investors who are located in California, in New York. They suddenly want to invest in London, in Frankfurt, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. They move the money and when you total all these movements of money in the world, you will see you have one billion dollars a per day? year and per day, per, per day? day, a day? Per day yes. in the world, moving, which are moving. moving, moving. moving. Yeah, so international trade. There is a, a professor in Yale University. Mr. He, Tobin. He, Mr. Tobin, yes. Professor Tobin, right. who is a fantastic uh, expert who has discovered and proposed a few years ago what is called the Tobin tax. Mm. If you uh, set a tax 
even small, 0.05% mm -hmm. of the movement of capitals in the world, you will get huge amounts of money every day. Mm -hmm. And if then you inject this money instead of keeping it in the circuit of capital exchanges for in international, you inject it in the consumers, then you will have unemployed who can uh, use money not only for survival or starvation, by the way, mm -hmm. because with $400 a month, if you have a family, you cannot survive. And uh, therefore, if they get additional money, which will be displaced from the international capital flows, which are circulating every day, then you can have an additional cons uh, consumption. It's, interesting. it's then, an interesting idea. Yeah. And, and I will take an example. Mm. An unemployed gets, let us say, from the government, $500 a month. Okay. An employed, if employed, he will get, let us say, $1,500 a month. Okay. For $1,000. Instance, for instance. Right. So, you have a difference of $1,000. Yes. So, we are not going to give to the consumers unemployed the whole $1,000, because then, the, the workers who are really employed, who, who do real work, they would be, they would resent the fact that they are working and the unemployed are not working and they get the same money as you. So there is a limit for uh, consumption distribution. Mm -hmm. It is to be lower and much lower than the real workers. Mm -hmm. But it has to be also higher mm -hmm. than starvation and survival. So in this example, I would suggest $1,000, $500 taken from the government allowance for unemployment, mm -hmm. and additional 500 which would be an injection of money for consumption purpose. Mm -hmm. And this is a, the subject of a study which uh, we are now starting uh, to find a solution to the unemployment and underconsumption in the world in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. It would be to inject, to instead of uh, keeping this traditional idea that the government is responsible to give money to the un unemployed, this is gone. So we have to tap another source, a big source, and it exists. There are heaps of money mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. And we have to dis displace it instead of staying in the uh, speculation of a capital market, to, to put aside, to earmark a little bit for uh, increasing the consumption uh, capability of unemployed. This it's is the idea. An, it's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea. I don't know who would administer that fund. I mean, would that be a new agency that would be developed? Would it be well, part of the United Nations? Would it be part of the World Bank? Would it be a new well, agency? Or, and who would have the authority to... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, at the sure. moment, I mean, we have a lot of questions that would come we up. We have a World Bank. It's a beautiful institution, Bretton Woods. It, uh, it has uh, done a fantastic work uh, since uh, 1950, and since uh, 50 years, developing uh, highways, dams, and uh, developing yes, large countries, projects, uh, right. manufacturing, yeah. agriculture, uh, health, etc., etc., education. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, what we need is not so much with uh, uh, big projects which have been experimented and it works very well. It is a direct injection of money at the consumer level of a needy, the yeah. needy. They, because they are not going to invest. They are going to spend immediately what you give them to the retailers. It will go directly from the, this fund for consumption into the pocket of uh, retailer shops. Mm -hmm. So the circuit is very short. You give it to a consumer and the uh, retailers uh, take it back. So the, the problem, it is to advance the money, to make a loan, a consumer loan, in mm -hmm. fact. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be to um, provide a consumer loan with, to the unemployed mm -hmm. with the ruling that they would reimburse three years after they get employed. 
Okay, let me ask a question. So if I may I ask a question. Then and this uh, allowance would be $500. I understand. Then okay. that could bring them into a thing yeah. that could give the, because the overall operation of the economy is being hurt because there's a lack of consumer purchasing power okay. among the people. Yeah. And you need to do it. Um, we've had this unemployment insurance in the United States. Somebody would be working and then they would lose their job and they would have a period, we've always seen it as a, and you say, a, you know, a temporary period to tide them over until they find another job. Yeah. So in a certain sense, your consumer injection of income would be in a certain sense tie, giving them, uh, tiding them over and you keep the work ethic and so forth uh, intact if you do not yeah. give them too much, but it would tide them over in a certain sense until they get together, yeah. get, 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 go, get mm -hmm. going. Now, what, what about, like in the sense with unemployment, what about the problem, and, or is it a problem? Maybe it's wrong. Maybe I'm wrong or something like that. What about the problem that the workers, we, we were talking earlier about the structurally, technologically displaced workers, that the workers who are being displaced by that downsizing movement with yeah. the rapid development of technology that can do massive amounts of production and so forth, that the, stru the unemployment is permanent unemployment. Yeah. Okay. That it is structural unemployment. Yeah. That the technology has finally caught up to us mm. to where the real source of production is technology yeah. and what a laborer is going to be able to claim income for doing in the name mm. of labor is no longer and will no longer right. and the trend will be that they will not be needed. In fact, they will get in the way yeah. of the yeah, machines I, that could produce tremendous amounts of goods and services and that the machines yeah. or the technology, the robots, yeah. are all so, owned by a relatively small group of people. Mm. But or, well, that's another question. Yeah. But what do you do in that case? Because okay. they're not going to get across. Yeah. There's not going to be job opportunities yeah. developing for them that they'd be able to compete in the marketplace yeah. with. So they're not. It's not unemployment where you have it for a little while and then you find a job. There aren't going to be uh, mm. remunerative jobs that are going to make it possible for them to live that way in the future because technology will constantly be displacing so, them and the generations to follow them. As you say, the production cycle does not need them. Right. Because we have a robot, we have a machine, we need a few workers here and then a huge factory. And, few and we few. don't need these workers. So yes. how can we do that? We, we have to use another term, which is Worker in reserve. Because you have to think about the real workers. They, they will get the money from their salary. And they, they, they merit it. But you have to think about the unemployed who, are, who cannot consume because we, told, we tell them, oh, sorry, we, you are unemployed, so you are not going to participate in the consumption uh, game. So we have to find another name. We have to think that everybody is a worker. Everybody. Because in a society, everybody should work. Look at the ants, for instance. The ants are all workers. They, they go here and there, they run everywhere. They all work. With in due respect, we're not ants. <laughs> we are not ants, but we should all work. Well, now that is so, a, so. Now that, I, I want to make a caveat here, or an yeah. asterisk here, to okay. come back and discuss that question. What do we mean by work? Well, and what about the going. activities that people do that are not in the marketplace no. and are not paid and commoditized? Which, you know, but go ahead, go ahead. So, we, I, I uh, introduced the um, concept of a pretext of work. It's not real work, it's not necessary really, but it is a kind of work which would be needed. It would be nice to have it done, but in fact, uh, nobody's paying for it. So, for instance, if you go in a railway, you, you see a lot of litter, papers, old bottles and cans around the rail track. So, nobody's going to pick it up because nobody is paying for this job. And then you have an environment which is uh, littered by all this uh, garbage. So this is a, a job which could be uh, proposed as a pretext of work. And when we have a pretext of work, the worker unemployed becomes active 
worker. He, he is in reserve, first of all. When he becomes unemployed, he's called worker in reserve. And after he has got a job, he becomes active worker. So you have a cycle of reserve workers, uh, which are, who are unemployed, and then active worker. And this is a cycle which uh, is interrupted by a period for schooling, for retraining. For instance, you have a lot of engineers who have been trained uh, 20, 30 years ago. They don't know anything about informatics, uh, computers. They have to go back to school to, to learn it. And this is uh, the cycle is active worker and then unemployed, called worker in reserve. And these reserve workers go back to school for adult training. Then they get up to date uh, about uh, technologies uh, which have be, uh, evolved. And they can then come back to, to the, the circuit of uh, active workers. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a cycle. Yeah, and, I, then, yeah. <coughs> and then this, uh, to, to reintroduce them into the um, circuit of uh, active working, you can consider pretext of work. For instance, uh, picking uh, the, it's an example, picking the litter in the streets uh, to uh, clean up uh, the environment, to uh, take care of uh, pollution. These are all jobs which are not paid at the moment, which, which would be very useful. Well, I don't know that those <coughs> jobs are very well paid. I mean, they're not paid now because uh, nobody does it. I mean, you could have that. They, we used to have a WPA in our depression here in the United States. We had and so forth. But I, I would propose to you a different notion. Ah. I and I want to address, if I may, this idea of work yeah. and this idea of labor and so forth. And I would say another piece, let me tell you a piece of work that was done in your own home country a piece of, uh, I mean, a great body of work that was created in your own home country. And that was the, the paintings of Vincent van Gogh. He painted yeah. absolute wondrous work. Yeah. Wondrous work. And in his whole life, I think Theo, I think they got a few franc for one painting only did it enter so, into the economy. So, so. It had nothing to do with the economy. Yeah. He was working because that's what he really wanted to do. He wasn't working because he was on a job or picking up papers alongside of a railroad track. A mother who loves a child and loves her child very well is in a certain sense working. That's right. Yeah. But is not, they're not paid for it. Maybe some yeah. people think they should. Mothers well, are not paid. It, it is extraordinary. But what I'm trying to get at in a certain sense is that the most, we have these robots that are coming with a tremendous productive capability that they can produce in the mass market, automobiles, television sets, uh, Sara Lee cake, and other kinds of things that can be produced in the mass market, none of which is much craftsmanship to it or anything. It's just a mass productive economy that has to have consumers to buy which can be bought and is needed. Mm. You see, we, need, we have that. But then you have the possibility of... Uh, of uh, people, other realms of human activity. Karl Marx, as a sociologist, would have said, or most any psychologist, it's important that we have something to do that gives us a sense of doing something worthwhile. Van Gogh, when he painted, felt very worthwhile that he painted that painting, and others did. Or most human emotions, uh, most of the relationships that there are between people are richer if they are non-commoditized if they're not a matter of exchanging money value between them for these things that are going on. Mm. Isn't it possible for there to be the possibility <coughs> that as the robots come and can displace labor, that we could have the ownership of the technology, instead of having a pluto an economic plutocracy, yeah. and we talk only about getting income to the mass of the people by having them have some make work job or something, yeah. that we could discuss the question of, who owns the robots? Yeah. Who owns the capital instruments that are really responsible for production, not make work, real production? They are increasingly responsible for producing things. And is it not possible to have policies that could begin to look at economic democracy, democracy or spreading ownership of the ownership of the robots, yeah. bringing the mass of the people in on the investment, you know, the logic of business finance, so that they can get those 
those, pro those, those things will pay for themselves out of future earnings and open up an alternative way of distributing income or building consuming power into the mass of the people that is in keeping with the way goods are being really, really produced, yeah. giving them the ability to buy mass-produced goods and the freedom to yeah. live a human life, which yeah. isn't, uh, you, know, uh, you know, like uh, to paint or to care with the children, to live a human life, and that would be a realm of activity that would not be commoditized, mm -hmm. another realm, but it would be work. Yeah. And that we don't have to turn every human function into something that is in the economy and grind human people up by trying to make them be surrogate robot functions in the mass-produced economy. Is there anything not to be addressed by that? And to get away from the idea that we can only distribute income to people by work or by trying to have them be a, a workforce in reserve or WPA or something like that, but that they ought to begin to be, do you understand what I'm saying? Is yeah. there not a problem? Because the long-term trend is they will have things that will pick up those little pieces of trash along the paper, the robots that will do yeah. it or something, or if that yeah. is the case. Yeah. But to get away from this idea that the work, the idea of work, yeah. and maybe people are afraid that people might begin to become independently leisured, yeah. and be able to do things without being, but I'm, I, do you understand the question? Yeah. And do you understand it as a potential, are there potential solutions yeah. to it, or is it something and, we should address? Uh, um, is Instead of employment, 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 ownership, 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 mm -hmm. as a way of creating consumer purchasing power in the mass of the world society. Yeah. So this could be combined with uh, uh, ownership of, uh, of stocks, for instance, yes. uh, in the public, much more uh, extend, extensive than at the moment, whereby, uh, as Mr. Kaiso uh, proposed, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, ownership of these stocks would be uh, widespread uh, in the public, which who would have an interest in uh, the extension, expansion of the companies because they would be uh, part uh, owners uh, of, uh, of this company and then they would uh, get the results from the activities of this uh, company. <coughs> or and even if it was extended into the general society, yeah. then you would be extending in the long term purchasing power into the society if they had uh, mutual funds or distribution, but they had a portfolio. And they yeah. got money the way the well-to-do get money now, which is by ownership of capital assets. Yeah. They get yeah. so If it's good Just for 5% of the people at the top, yeah. it might be good for everybody. We have an economic mm -hmm. plutocracy. Yeah. And do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. We have an economic yeah. democracy. Yeah. Uh, it might be something that, but all of our policy decisions always focus only on employment as a yeah. way of getting income to people. Yeah. And we're running into some real structural problems, I think. Mm. You know. Yes, uh, I think it would be a good uh, combination with uh, other means uh, to that uh, this um, ownership and the public uh, would uh, change uh, many things uh, as regards uh, income from capital, yeah. which would be uh, on not only the for the benefit of a very few people, but uh, for the benefit of a nation. Yeah. And uh, I, my approach would be as you as you, you know, to emphasize the loss of sales yes, the due to the under consumption, mm -hmm. because even famous uh, marketers of uh, large uh, corporations who are scrutinizing the market to try to find <coughs> some areas where we could sell more, we should be made aware of the fact that the business of under-consumption is a very large business, like a virgin forest where nobody has cut the trees. Yes. And then they could get a, a number of um, sales of a huge level. I will take an example. I take back my example of $1,500 for yes. the employed, $500 for the unemployed. Mm -hmm. The difference, $1,000. If you multiply this by the potentially active population of the world, you arrive at a, a $800 billion. And this is a, the market which uh, is uh, <coughs> available and which is not tapped by the companies because of this under-consumption. Mm -hmm. So 
if we would uh, uh, find a way to advance by loans, consumer loans, uh, money to uh, needy uh, so that they can consume uh, at a normal level with $500 per person, then it will be a, a, good, uh, <coughs> a good increase in the, in the sales of uh, corporations. Absolutely. It would create, uh, here, if you want to, it would, it, would cre <laughs> it, would, it would create the market. And as Mr. Ford used to talk to Mr. Ruther at the Ford factory, he said, uh, we're going to have these workers paid $5 a day. And Mr. Ruther used to say to Mr. Ford, well, the, you're, you're going to need to pay them that in order they'll have the money in order to buy the cars. You need yeah. to have a market demand mm. built in at the same time that you're building the supply. Yeah. And we're, we're hurting nationally yeah. and internationally by the fact that uh, there is uh, underconsumption capability among the mass of the people, yeah. right? That's absolutely true. I so uh, <coughs> what, uh, what uh, uh, my proposal is essentially to try to uh, find a, a, a supplement to the uh, traditional uh, unemployment allowance of a government. This uh, would be called a consumption allowance. Yes, consumption allowance. Consumption yeah, allowance, right, right. which would uh, be added to the Unemployment allowance, $500 plus $500, then an unemployed would get $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. With this, he is able to buy and to consume. And this $500 a month would give a kick, a fantastic kick, to, to, to the retailers uh, for, for their sales. And this is the idea. And yeah. how shall we finance it? Well, well I, 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 oh, well, like go, ahead, go ahead, go ahead, yes, go ahead. Go ahead. How oh. shall we finance mm -hmm. it? We are not going to, to, go, to ask the government to give any more money because he has not any money. Mm -hmm. We are going to, to uh, find the money where it is, which means in the international capital markets, mm -hmm. which is uh, full of money. And then if we uh, arrange as it has been proposed by the United Nations in Copenhagen in uh, March mm -hmm. 1995, mm -hmm. if, we, uh, in, uh, if we set a tax, such as the Tobin tax, to derive a little bit of this international capital money into the consumer loans business, then we will have a direct impact on the sales and we will come back from a recession to an expansion and a boom of economy. Perhaps. And we have to get a system to recover this money afterwards. The only thing that bothers me a little bit, if I may, is that, as you say, they're going to give them a, a low, let's say, a $500, and I'm not sure what the agency would be and everything, but the, to administer the funds of a Tobin tax intake from yeah. foreign you know, uh, m currency movements and so forth, but, uh, and you give them a consumption loan for $500, after that is done, uh, they, they, they would, in the normal course of events, have to pay that back. Pay that back. So, so I mean, you, you, they, they, they can consume for as long as they can get that. Hmm. So in a certain sense, you're, you're taxing and spending. You're going to tax the international capital markets to distribute <laughs> to the mass. And do you intend that to be a permanent tax? Do you intend that relationship to be a permanent tax upon the the international capital markets to s distribute income through some agency to the people of the world based upon their yeah. need when, when uh, you, indefinitely when, or until when, what point? And when you buy a stock, uh, you, you buy an IBM in, uh, in Singapore or in, uh, in London because it's ch cheaper to, to buy it there, then the cost in, uh, in the cost of your purchase, you add a little 0.05 percent, uh, which will go to to uh, stimulate the consumption. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? That how did the people that are the international capitalists or the successful <laughs> people get to have such a successful because. relationship? And it has been, if I'm, it seems to me, it has been. They have been able to, let's say, purchase or buy the stock that represents the technology that is the source of the production. And they have been able to wait for that period of time, out of savings, let's say. And they've been able to wait for that period for those capital instruments to pay for themselves out of their future earnings. 
Hmm. And they did. <coughs> Charles de Gaulle had said at one time, to stick to wages alone is to stick to an eternal class struggle. We must break out of the idea that we can only have uh, we, uh, yeah. the level of investment be out of savings. We ask <coughs> people to... But the mass of the people can't do that. But the people who are well off have the capital too, and the, they can, in a certain sense, self-assure against loss. They can, they can do, they can, and it's because they have that ability to invest in the future that they begin to keep getting more and more wealthy all the time. They have all the more and yeah. more money. Now, this consumer tax that you're, or this consumer distribution system, yeah. um, is, is there, is there, the, the mass of the people cannot invest because they have little left over from, they don't have enough to consume now. But is there not some way to be able to get them so that they could have the same advantages in a sense of access to capital credit so that they could purchase stocks or purchase robots <coughs> similar to the way that the people who are well endowed now do, have those robots pay for themselves out of the future earnings. But I mm. don't see how you can get around that payback period. Mm. Uh, and then they have a piece of stock, an ownership of the robot, and because they own the robot five years out, on the basis of that ownership, they have income. Yeah. Not on the basis of distributing uh, uh, a consumption-based uh, mm. tax to them, because that's not going to build any wealth into them or address the question of long-term technological displacement of workers and uh, the importance, increasing importance, <coughs> of capital to the productive process. Yes, but when, when you are in the level of poverty or starvation, right. if, you, if you receive some money, you are not going to buy a robot, you are going to buy something to eat. Exactly. You are going to do something to, sh to, to close, or to close your Absolutely. family. Absolutely, I understand. And to go to uh, school and all these things. And or to the hospital. Right. So, you know, it's very nice to say, oh, we give you money when you are going to buy a robot, but they won't because they are angry. So, this uh, it's I a rock No, I understand. I understand. <laughs> and it, no, no, no. But but I do say that I, I would say I would suggest to you that um, the doing it on the basis of consumption is a, an international brand of tax and spend. It yeah. will be called tax and spend and distributing according to that. That's that. that but I would say that it is a, because the people cannot look long term beyond their immediate consumption needs, yeah. is what has made it so that they are never, that we have such an economic plutocracy. The, the people who have that advantage and are able to gain income from their capital and from yeah. the ownership of the wealth, yes, right, is, is what is, 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 is part of the problem because the distribution of, uh, of income to laborers is not working. So we have a long-term structural problem that a consumption-oriented yeah. aspect will not address. Yeah. A consumption-oriented aspect would be needed in the short term, but there has to be also a long-term, I would suggest, a long-term, yeah, they might, mm -hmm. uh, a long-term policy direction that will address and bring the mass of the people in accord with the way yeah. goods are really produced yeah. so that it takes five years or so to pay back for your capital investment. It mm. can begin to start throwing off income after about five years. Mm. I don't, I mean, I'm just suggesting those two things yeah. might possibly be, go, go together. those two things might be part of yeah. a new policy, uh, uh, combining two aspects yeah. of a new policy, but the rationale for distributing income after that income has, that, that stock has paid for itself, the rationale for, for the money being given to them is not a, a, a fragile tax system that might be voted away. It is the base, it is the same, it is ownership of the robot or the ownership of the stock, ownership in the corporation, produce, the robot producing the goods and services. Mm -hmm. That's the, the source of the income, long-term source of mm -hmm. income for the mass of the people in a democratic system rather than in a plutocratic one in wealth. We want mm. to begin to have some pattern to distribute wealth mm. uh, rather than just consuming power. Mm. On a sh and in a long-term basis, it would seem to me, and the mm. two might combine, but you're right, it's, mm. that's the main problem. Most people cannot even think about getting <laughs> any investment income or any of this capital because they can't wait for the capital to pay for itself. They're immediately involved in their consumption, and that's been one of the reasons perhaps they, did, they never think about it. But mm -hmm. I don't know that that doesn't necessarily mean 
that we shouldn't think about it, particularly mm -hmm. if the downsizing and the displacement of uh, workers by technology is structural and long-term, mm -hmm. and the trend is away from the real input of labor to the productive process. That's all, you know. Yeah. And um, what I want to emphasize is that um, if there is a loss in sale in the present uh, scheme of the economic system, this will interest the banks, which will interest the corporations, sure. all the suppliers uh, which are, who are looking for some uh, additional uh, sale. They will be interested in a scheme where uh, there will be a possibility to increase uh, the consumption so that their sale will increase and the profits will increase, the banks uh, will receive uh, dividends and, and all these uh, uh, sort of things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The people at the top is that we yeah. have a great interest in trying to get greater yeah. consuming power Con among the masses consuming of the consuming power. So yeah. that they might be interested so in It's a matter of loan. It's a, it's a loan uh, to loan some money to the consumer get them retrained so that they become active worker for a real purpose. But as the offer of work is very limited, we have to accept that they work for uh, some uh, pretext of work which are not very, very necessary. But they, it will be good for their behavior to know that they are not unemployed. They are workers. We are mm -hmm. re first of all workers in reserve and then active workers in some community work. And there is a lot of uh, projects in the United States to do some uh, community uh, services, mm -hmm. community work. This is a lot of uh, businesses uh, which are starting uh, on a community uh, basis. Mm -hmm. and then uh, this would be an increase in consumption as soon as you pay uh, workers to uh, participate in this uh, effort in the community services, in the cities, in the counties, in uh, the struggle against pollution for the environment and uh, toxic materials and all these things. So this uh, is uh, the idea. And the second idea, it is not to tap always the government because it's not anymore possible, mm. but uh, to um, reach uh, the capital uh, funds which are available, which are in the international circuits and, and not completely untapped, uh, not even taxed somewhere so, uh, sometimes, because they are, they are succeeding in escaping the traditional uh, national uh, tax system for the, for, the perp for the reason that we are outside uh, the, the national circuits, mm -hmm. and therefore they are available for somebody to divert a little bit of it uh, to the problems of uh, consumer loans. Mm -hmm. And this would be a source of money, which is called the Tobin tax. And therefore, uh, this is the idea to, um, uh, to try to, to uh, find a way to, uh, this will um, start up also the industrialization in the developing countries, the activity, economic activity in the developing countries. In uh, the developed countries where you can uh, observe now a certain uh, stagnation of the uh, economy, and this would uh, give uh, new uh, markets uh, because uh, a, a, a range of consumers, which is at the moment uh, untapped, will be introduced in the economic circuit for a very good reason that they will become uh, consumers also. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, uh, my, um, I will give you an, an example, a comparison. I am from a country, a, a, a legal uh, city, where there is a lake. And every year, the algae in spring begin to grow, and you have to cut them. So the algae float on the lake, and they are evacuated by a river under a bridge and they go down the stream. Some of the algae are, or algae? Algae. Yeah, algae, 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 yeah, algae, excuse yeah. me, algae. Mm. Um, some of the algae are evacuated by the mainstream. But some others are stuck on the, on the sides, you know, on the, the sides. Bank, of bank or the sides. The, the banks, the, ba the, the river banks, yes, yes. and they are stuck there. Mm -hmm. This is happens with the capital. Mm -hmm. You have 
some capital which is flowing back to the consumption circuit, and some other capital which is stuck on the banks and which is available there because it is not in the circuit. So the purpose of all this uh, scheme, it is to reintroduce these capitals which are aside of the main consumption mm -hmm. and to put them back in the consumption stream. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, well, Lord knows, the question that you bring up, we only have a couple of minutes left, I'm sorry, the question you bring up is absolutely essential, that the, the lack of consumer purchasing power is the main power, a main problem that confronts the operation of the world economy and the national economies, and it's a major problem confronting mankind, and it, 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 it certainly is. I'm, I'm not sure there are many questions that are raised. Obviously, it's a big subject, and, we, I, and I do think that conference is one that ought to be held so that people can begin to address that, 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 that issue. I don't know. I'm wondering who the agency would be and to what degree would that tax go. It sounds a little bit like we're taxing and spending, taxing the, the capital markets in order to distribute to the people, and if it's a little bit like Mr. Tobin says, let's make it a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know, but there's a lot of questions, but it's absolutely beginning to address the most fundamental uh, question. I uh, congratulate you on the work and think that the, the work, now the, the conference you, you, you're planning is going to be um, Club of Rome, Club of Rome. World Future Society. World Future Society in Washington in July. Uh huh, uh huh, in July. So I would be glad to give you, to inform you about uh, the outcome of this. Uh, uh, conference, uh -huh. because uh, I think it would be a very, very interesting uh, subject. Most important problem confronting mankind, if in the various ways in which it can be addressed, is one that, uh, and you've done it, and of course we've talked about the work of Stanley Ronowitz and uh, others, The End of Work, the book by uh, Jeremy Rifkin and Lewis Kelso's work in trying to disseminate yeah. some ownership of capital. It might be another part of the mix, but there ought to be a, a conference and conclaves to discuss this all question beyond the normal way in which things are functioning, because we're heading for some shoals, as it were, and we need to deal with it. Okay. Um, well, Dr. Chattel, thank you thank really you, yeah. very, very much. Yeah, well, thank thanks you. very much for coming in, and I do look forward to uh, talking with you off camera and so forth on, the, on yeah. this particular subject. And I would invite you, I mean, I, in, uh, remind you, it's been your pleasure to have the perception of Dr. Bertrand Chattel. He's an uh, international consultant now. He's in New York, uh, in New York City, can be contacted, and he, is, uh, he was a science advisor to the United Nations He's addressing these uh, questions that is perhaps the major problem confronting mankind in its various dimensions that we were skirting about here is how are we going to be able to get consuming power and let the economic system function uh, the way it ought to without arterial sclerosis on the river with clogged up with algae. Happy to bring you that. Invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back. Dr. Chattel, once again, thank you very much for coming in. Thank you very until, much. Until next time. Have they got a definite date set for that conference? July. I hope you come. I should buy. I hope you Although come. I, you want to make videos with, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. with uh, participants? I have, I, have, I, I have such a, I don't know, I have such a view. I really have this idea of employment. I don't like the idea of. No, you don't like. But you I could, don't like the idea of, yeah. Why don't I you make a presentation on the case of Well, sure, I could, uh, although it's, it's very hard. At this conference, that would be Yeah, good. I would love to. Sure, yeah. I would. I don't know they would, anybody would want to, you know, to yes, we want it. consider it because it's so different, you know, than yeah. most people think. They want to keep this employment thing in place all the time. I want to free people. For, if you think 100 years out and there, you, you still, you've got this employment model only, I, I would like people to be able to get to be leisured yeah. and, order, and with income as a model for the world. So that, and, and instead of trying to turn everything, all human relationships into a commodity, who administers?